The origins of the lizard folk known as the Seraphon is one of sorrow. After the destruction of their homeworld, the world that was at the hands of Chaos, they fled to the stars. The Slan, an ancient servant race of the Old Ones, sought to lead them to Sanctuary. During their travel amongst the stars, whilst crossing the Gulf of Eternity, Rakothian, the Great Drake, looked on in awe for these glittering motes of dusts, which travelled through the darkness. Curiosity bested the beast, and the Star Drake drew closer. It was then that he sensed the minds of the Slan, and within the memories, a dreadful mix of loss and rage. In his commune with the ancient Slan, did the great Drake see a vision of the world that was. The chaos that wrought the world asunder caused his anger to boil, and tears rained from the beast. A piercing cry broke from its throat, echoing around the void. The Slan were drawn to this cry, following the blazing silver stars that were the Drake's tears. It was then the Seraphon were guided to the realm of Azu. Once more the race could take their place amongst a realm's heavens. However, such a journey had taken a monumental toll on the Slan. Many had fallen fighting the Dark Gods in the previous centuries, whilst others had simply vanished. The previously thought immortal beings ruined by the endless battles that had raged across the mortal realms. However, some yet lived. Despite the death of their bodies, the strength of their spirits burned bright. Existing within these decaying mortal forms, these creatures of incredible celestial magic still bore a physical presence. The Seraphon are known as the Warriors of the Stars, and legend speaks of an empire within the stars far above Sigmaron, beyond the reach of all but the Slam themselves. This was the place they would dwell, waiting for the call of the Star Masters. This was home. The only known observation that is truly known about the Seraphon warriors is that they only appear when in the presence of a Slan. They are seemingly manifested through the ancient seer's memories, brought forth in the eternal light of Azure. The ziggurat ships which carried the Seraphon are akin to floating cities which hang within the heavens. Beneath the great pyramid structures sit star engines and world morphing instruments, allowing them to hold their position. These ships typically sit within the upper reaches of Asia. When the Seraphon warriors are called to battle, small realm gates appear before them, within the same ships, sending them to battle. Should a mortal ever gaze upon these warp travelling ships, their mind would be unable to comprehend them. Such a mix between science and the arcane in a near seamless fashion bends the minds of those other than the Seraphon. Most of the Seraphon live within the World Chambers, an incredible creation which replicates the sweltering tropical heat, humidity and jungle that the Seraphon once called home. It is here that the Seraphon eternally hunt in massive jungle paddocks, waiting the summon of battle. Overlooking the Saurus and Skink cohorts, the Skink priests observe from tiered balconies, picking those from the herds which might be destined for greatness within the Great Plan. Temple cities are gleaming golden cities amongst the wilds of the realm. These are bastions of strength, which guard pools of power from the Astro Matrix. Once a temple fleet has landed, it is within the Slan's ability to manipulate the very space of the city with that which can be seen often being referred to as merely a drop in the ocean compared to the vast sprawl of their mighty temple cities. For much of the infrastructure has been born into the dirt, altering the caverns to subterranean paradise. The Old One's treasures are then hidden. Realm Shaper engines play a crucial role within the security of the Seraphon temple cities. These devices having come to rest within the earth after detaching from the temple vessels. The great engines are multi-leveled structures crested with a great emerald-like crystal, and once charged with celestial energy, the orb atop begins to throb with barely contained power, before pulsing shockwaves are emitted across the land. These waves terraform the landscape according to the vision of the Old Ones, and are capable of turning a desolate wasteland to a thriving jungle over the course of days and weeks. A sweltering jungle environment brings the life that would inhabit such a place, 
buzzing insects and a host of serpentine life slither amongst the jungle floor. Many of the temple cities and realm shaper engines sit atop critical nodes within the Astro Matrix network, allowing the Slan Star Masters to tap into these immense banks of ethereal energy. A little known side effect though is that these jungles created by the structures take on the qualities of the home realm. An example of this would be the Shyesh jungles, which are weathered and emaciated. No two temple cities are the same, however they are capable of originating from the same temple vessel, and can now be located thousands of kilometres apart. With the number of Slan declining, some of these cities are now governed by the venerable Skink Starseers. Starseers relying upon celestial divination and the inscriptions on ancient plaques to interpret the Great Plan. They often discuss and heed the words of oracles which often offer their counsel. Each temple city has been carefully aligned to channel the energies of the Astro Matrix, the structures within each city acting as superconductors for the immense power that travels through the ley lines underneath, powering arcane technology and feeding the star rituals of the Seraphon. This is only possible due to the incredible material known as Celestite. The substance appears to be a form of super-hardened stone, however, the origins are yet untraced. It is in the remote and primal cities in which the blood sacrifices to the Old Ones and their glory take place. These primal forms of the Seraphon take grand pleasure in offering their masters the verminous Skaven. These rat-like creatures are hated by the Seraphon for their past deeds in the world that was and the steps of their temple cities often run slick in the gore of the rat folk. Dread fills their ears as they await to be taken to the sacrificial table, knowing that their end is come. Slan Star Masters are masters of order and strive for an era of perfect structure within the universe, and such a task could be completed in an innumerous amount of ways. However, there's always been one persistent opponent to this, the force of chaos. The Chaos Gods seek forever to undo their plans, for this would be their undoing also. With this in mind, it is no wonder that the Seraphon, a manifestation of the Slan's will, will hate Chaos in every form it takes. The fact, however, is that the forces of Chaos seem to multiply within an age of bloodshed, whilst the Slan barely cling to existence. This pressures the Seraphon to choose their battles wisely, for the mortal realms are a great chessboard, which the armies of Chaos must be outmaneuvered, careful observations to an unfathomable plan that guides their path must be made, for this is the true power of the mighty Seraphon. The qualities of the Slan are purposely picked by their great designers, and as the foremost servant of the Old Ones, the Slan learnt the mastery of the Arcane and the principles of the Realm Gate technology, with some even believing that the Slan assisted in the creation of the Realm Gates within the world that was, which may have led to its eventual destruction. Slan are often flanked by a host of Skink Starseers and Star Priests, which are responsible for the administration of Seraphon society. The Slan reside in chambers steeped within potent temporal magic, often sitting above the wellsprings of leyline powers. They impose control on lands that otherwise would be rotting to the corruption of chaos, and reshape the world to better serve the Great Plan. When the Slan take the battlefield, they manifest creatures influenced by their mindset. This can lead to differing forms of Seraphon to appear with differing markings. Some Slan that are slowly cracking under the mental strain of their seemingly impossible task have begun to manifest more twisted and hideous forms, however they remain incredibly effective killing machines. Not in the strength of arms or in the vast arcane knowledge they possess, but in the unshakable belief in their creator's plan is the Slan's strength. However, the peril which the Slan faced within the world that was has perhaps left them divided on the best approach for the wars within the mortal realms. 
often enduring a millennia in exile, when the slan gather, it is a truly momentous occasion, for such a manifestation of their will is a truly terrifying sight for all of those that have embraced chaos within their heart. The slan proved wise with their effort, their favourite targets in the war against the forces of chaos were against places of particular magical energy. These ley lines of arcane energy pooled in locations similar to the Realm Gate network, and by taking control and purifying such locations, the slan could impose a measure of order into the vast web of conjunctions which travelled across and throughout the realms. However, what the slan hoped to achieve by controlling these locations is unknown. One is only to assume that this is some measure to prevent the great enemy from accomplishing a victory. This network is now known as the Astral Matrix Arcane. For all the foresight that the Slan may possess, they were unable to predict such a titanic event that was the Necroquake caused by Nagash. Even the realm of Azir was not safe. The stars slowly faded, and the light died. For a race that was so tied to the stars and constellation, this was a truly disastrous occasion. Entire temple cities went dark, as morbid energy suffocated their slan lords, causing the spawning pools to fall silent. This also had a near catastrophic consequence for the realm of Shayesh, for the incredible backlash energies which travelled the ley lines could have wrought the realm asunder. Whilst perhaps the most unintentional of all the obstacles the Seraphon faced was from the goblins of the Gloom Spike Gits. Adding insult to injury, their horrible idol, the Bad Moon, cast its ugly gaze across the scars. Its leering gaze travelled, twisting the constellation in horrible forms. Of course, behind it all was the laugh of the Dark Gods. This perhaps shows the unwavering faith within the Great Plan best, that the resolve of the Seraphon remained unbroken. The Seraphon struck out across the realms, re-establishing their control for the Astromatrix Arcane, particularly within the realm of Shayesh, where the horrible energies that had travelled along the ley lines had created new paths. The forces of Seraphon are unlike any mortal army within the realms, able to take the battlefield at a moment's notice, for they are held in a permanent state of battle readiness. Appearing in varying forms dependent on the slam that manifests these mighty creatures, with some arriving from the heavens upon falling stars, whilst others step from sunlight that strikes through the darkness. Their arrival is immediate and presence is known, for as long as the slan stand, reinforcements can be brought from Azure, and survivors of the Seraphon attack speak of gigantic monsters wrought into being within their very ranks, shattering any coherence that the unit had. It was at the Gore Vale that the slan first encountered Sigmar's Stormcast Eternals, locked in a bitter battle with the Cornite masses of the Bloodbound. As the Stormcast raised their eyes to encounter the new force, they immediately recognised the assistance had come. The Seraphon forces smashed into the rear guard of the Cornite Horde. Saurus rampaged through the Chaos Lines, smashing their mortal bodies with their mighty Celestite clubs. It was then that the Stormcast pushed forward, joining the Seraphon in the obliteration of the Chaos Force. Whilst not a word was passed between any, a single thought was shared between both sides, and that was the purification of the mortal realms. As the final dark corrupt idols within the Gorvale tumbled, and the terrible final cultists put to death, the Stormcast forces watched their allies disappear into beams of bright starlight. The forces of Sigmar's hammers held aloft in salute to their great ally, as the final skink left the field. Since this point forward, the Seraphon and Stormcast have been seen together in battle against their common foe. Seraphon culture and society is built upon the constellations which the beasts belong to, with each of these having their own distinctive markings, cultures and means to wage war. These all provide a link back to the realm of Azure, with names which are linked to the great zodiacal constructs which litter the upper vaults of the heavens. The Stormborn, consist of great temple ships, surrounded by spawning vessels which are controlled by the slan to mirror a particular star pattern 
seeking to attract the constellation's grand power. Whereas the coalesced live within grand temple cities, which are founded upon the settlement of their temple fleet. Those spawned under the fangs of Sotek are known to strike with the speed of a coiled fighter. These forces generally consist of skin cohorts which specialise in hit and run ambush strikes which fray the nerves of enemy forces, with those of the Thunder Lizards unleashing any and all tools within their arsenal to prevent the taint of chaos from despoiling their lands. Hellish arcane magics are brought to war on the back of brutish beasts. They pursue the Great Plan, which is a vision given to the Slan by the Old Ones for them to bring to the mortal realms. However, they must all interpret this Great Plan, often with differing results. However, it is said that a great calamity separated them from their children. Lost was a race with the power and intellect to create creatures of great design and bring them into existence. The Slan still weep for this. These now lost beings are still worshipped by the Seraphon for their supreme intellect and great design for all things. However, there is an insidious fear creeping into the minds of some Slan. This fear is that they are no longer following the Great Plan and have begun to misinterpret the signs and glyphs with consequences which could tear the very fabric of reality apart. When the Seraphon arrive to the battlefield upon the starlit beams of light, the ground begins to tremble as vast cohorts of reptile warriors are called forth. Under golden glyphic banners, they muster. They form into tightly disciplined ranks, with even the most feral of beasts awaiting the order of their slan master. When the Seraphon take the field within the mortal realm, they are generally guided by a single leader. Usually either a skink or saurus is called by the slan to lead their force. When a slan musters many cohorts, they are said to form a star host, but just as the stars in the sky form a pattern, so does the star host embody a specific role within the battlefield. When slan are at war, they bring forth complementing cohorts, adapting to the demands of the battlefield to best defeat their foe. Should a defiant defence be required, ranks of saurus guard and warriors will be summoned to the battlefield, beneath a champion such as a sunblood. If the enemy's defences are proving formidable, a slan may bring forth a monstrous beast, such as a stegodon or bastilodon, taking the form from the slan's memories. Lord Croak is a great slan. The oldest of their kind is believed to be filled with the light of azure, and is an incredible vessel for arcane power. Lord Croak had first fought within the wars of the world that was, against the great enemy, and it was here that he first fell during the defence of Itza. His skink attendants were distraught, however collected every chunk of Croc's smashed body, and with great reverence rebuilt his form with resin-soaked bandages. Such was the creation of the first relic priest. The great power of the slan so powerful that they yet might play host to their dead physical form. As a Saurus warrior survives more and more battles, their wealth of experience and knowledge grows. Not only their ability to butcher the Slan's foe, but also their leadership of their peers. They are instinctive leaders, recognising instantaneously the keys for victory and reorganising the cohort around them with a series of growls. As these Saurus age, their scales continue to harden and thicken with corded muscles adding mass to their already hulking frames. Scars from old wounds litter their body, giving these beasts their name, the Scar Veterans. These are the frontline commanders of the Seraphon army, often given control of the assembly of cohort and possess an innate skill to rally their kin into a primal rage. Those that continue to defy death during the battles of the Seraphon army are eventually known as Old Bloods, promoted to the management of Constellation's military force, to protect that which the Seraphon hold dear, their precious cities and relics. While Saurus can speak, they are not a talkative type, and leaders often settle their disagreements with ritual combat, rather than in the debate hall. Force leads the Saurus warriors, not words. The Sunbloods are held in awe by other Seraphon forces, 
Their gleaming scales shimmer with heavenly energies. These monstrously strong saurus have been around since the first days of the Age of Myth. Sunbloods are the martial champions of the Saurus warriors, and the personification of their race's savage fury. Typically, leaving the matters of strategy to the Old Bloods, these warriors, however, are adept at determining weaknesses within the enemy's force. Waiting until the time is right, a blood-curdling roar will be loosed. Instinctually, the surrounding forces will fall upon the Sunbloods' chosen target. Powerful jaws and clubs wrenching and clubbing the foe. The Sunblood are trusted to defend vital areas such as the spawning pools of a temple city, with some of the skin priests that reside there believing that they are a wellspring of concentrated Azerite energy, and this exists within each Sunblood. Whereas the Saurus hold them in a much different regard, believing that they are avatars of battle. Each of these magnificent warriors is a shard of the lost reptilian war deity, come to fight by their side against the ancient foe. The bearers of the Astrolith are not the greatest of fighters, nor leaders. However, these have been earmarked by the Slan to have a great destiny. Though the Saurus are not prideful, much satisfaction is felt when selected to be a bearer. The astrolith are discs of glyph-inscribed celestite surrounding a mysterious globe. These artifacts are capable of channeling vast amounts of celestial energy. These are particularly common within the Starborn constellation, for the process in which Aslan manifests his warriors into existence is sped up when a bearer is nearby, acting as a conduit for their immense powers. Those that have risen through the ranks of the Saurus Guard that surround their Star Masters are known as the Eternity Wardens, for these Saurus hold a most sacred duty, which is to oversee the defence of their Star Masters. For such a task is a requirement when the Slan take the field. They are an irresistible target for any opposing army, for they lack the strength of arms to defend themselves. Eternity Wardens impose a calming presence on other Saurus commanders, allowing them to better focus on the business of warfare strategies and command of their cohorts. The Warden seems the Wardens seem to have two states, motionless and frenzied action. Any that venture too close to their masters are brutally clubbed down with their massive maces inspiring their Saurus kin to fight harder against the foe, for to be found wanting in the eyes of an Eternity Warden is a fate worse than death. The Saurus Shock Troops are a well-skilled cavalry force that are masters in all manners of war. From hit and run to line-breaking mass charges, they charge forward beneath icons of coiled serpents. The Saurus are mounted on their charges, known as the Cold Ones. These fierce beasts are deadly and cunning forces on the battlefield. Feral Cold Ones are known to be foul-tempered beasts, and often wish to lead solitary lives. The Saurus Knights are a subspecies of the Saurus, thought to be blessed by the Old One Itzel, the father of beasts. They have adapted dew claws that allow them to accurately guide their steed even whilst fighting. Under the guidance of these Saurus, these two separate entities become one incredible killing machine, a frenzy of weapons and teeth slaughtering any that stand before them. The stoic Saurus Guard are the protectors of their slant masters, their tightly locked shields forming vast shield walls of scale and celestite. Unlike most Seraphon, these Saurus do not rise from spawning pools and cohorts. As casualties occur amongst the ranks of the guard, they rise in ones and twos silently marching towards the armories of their brothers, collecting their sacred armour and weapons. However, such casualties are rare, for these are the masters of defensive warfare, with incredibly thick scales and seemingly invulnerable within their shield wall formations. The Saurus exist purely to pursue war. With total obedience to the Slan, they are unwavering in their pursuit to destroy chaos and any who might aid it. Typical Saurus are spawned in cohorts, forging an almost telepathic kinship within the group that will last as long as any amongst the group live. They are able to communicate details of war through the group almost instantaneously, allowing for all members to be aware of the current state of the cohort within battle. 
The Saurus warriors are a truly fierce sight to behold. Their claws, shaped and as sharp as daggers, their muscle structure filled an incredibly large frame of knotted powerful muscle. Powerful scaled tails whip and thrash as they mobilize capable of shattering legs and ribs. Their massive powerful jaws are lined with rows of razor sharp teeth, waiting to tear the throat of any cultist that gets close enough. The Celestite clubs and spears that they are armed with are deadly in their hands, capable of bludgeoning and impaling any the Slan command. The highest ranked of the Skink Spellcrasters is the Starseers. These are incredibly powerful Skinks, with few in the mortal realms able to match their vast knowledge and incredible raw connection to the realm of Azure. Capable of divining the meaning of star patterns to anticipate events within the cosmos and their interstellar ramifications, and best determine the downfall of the enemies of the Seraphon. Most Slan are served by a number of these Starseers, lending them their already incredible power for acts of incredible arcane potency. They also ensure that commands of the Slan are distributed to the Warhosts. The Starseers are perhaps best known for their bending of the Celestite material that the Seraphon are equipped with. The mightiest amongst these are able to create incredible floating thrones that allow them to travel above their cohorts. On a rare occasion, the activation of a spawning pool will generate a solitary skink, and more often than not, these prove to be skilled within magical arts. These skinks, whilst talented, require tuition under the Starseers, with several often attending to one Starseer, with the most promising occasionally attending to a slan. These beasts are often known for their diplomacy in dealing with non-Seraphon creatures, and have even been known to set up embassies throughout the mortal realm free cities. Often, more proactive than their Starseer seniors, these Star Priests are capable of celestial bolts of lightning, scouring the enemy's formations in an instant. Equipped with serpent-shaped staves, with many coating this in a venom of the fellow Seraphon creatures causing any that come into contact to die in frothing convulsions. It is the Skink Priests that the running of daily Seraphon society falls to. These are the Skinks that have excelled in craft or war, and are charged with taking their master's words through the heaving crowds of the temple cities. Skink Priests are often responsible for numerous cohorts of Skink work gangs, and competition between the cohorts is fierce, with each seeking to outdo the other in a bid to raise grander structures to the old ones. The Skink Priests seek to abuse this mentality, to ensure that the highest production quotas are met for weapons and tools. During times of war, the Priests will gather their Skink cohorts and lead them into battle. Though they possess no magical ability themselves, they have been entrusted with examples of the Old One's technology, capable of unleashing white-hot bursts of energy as bright as a star. Oracles are the strangest of the Skink breed, in which there is no formal induction process. Rather, they seem to have come into being through direct magical intervention of a slan within the spawning process. Such an occurrence is incredibly rare, and the skink that crawls forth from the spawning pool is identified by its split-tailed form. These generally impassive creatures only truly come to life when the presence of a slan comes over them. Their eyes roll back, and with a frothing mouth, spew a stream of proclamations. These are eagerly transcribed by nearby priests. Such is the connection of these oracles and the slan that they are capable of channeling their sorceries through them despite the distance. The oracles have developed a curious relationship with the despised beasts known as the troglodons, or otherwise known as the Pale Death. These creatures, sharing a twin-tailed characteristic, with oracles often riding atop them into battle. The largest and fiercest of the skinks, which has distinguished themselves on the battlefield, rise to the ranks of the chief. It is their charge to maintain order and cohesion within battle amongst the skink cohorts. These chiefs often soar high above the battlefield on flying beasts, crying shrill orders to their skink allies below. The choice of mount is often a reflection of the personality of the skink and defines the role which they will play within a battle. Those that choose to ride the loyal pterodons are often known as the masters of the skies. 
their deep understanding and connection with their chosen mounts allows them to perform death-defying maneuvers, rendering them impossible to hit from ground-based missile weapons. Those which dare to ride the Ripodactyl are known to be amongst the most aggressive of the skink kind. Their role is to launch devastating hit and run strikes, breaking the opposition forces down. These bold, bravado filled skinks are often the first of the Seraphon forces to taste battle, giving the most nervous of skink cohorts the courage to fight in the name of the old ones. Herodon riders saw high above the battlefield in flocks, their shrill calls echoing around the battleground. Their massive leathery wings act as perfect gliders, allowing the skink pilots to expertly ride the rising hot air currents, allowing them to adjust their height. When set in a dive, the pterodon dive hard, their aerodynamic form led by rows of razor sharp teeth, eagerly waiting to meet the foe. The pterodon riders try to avoid close quarters combat, for such a style of warfare is not suited to their mounts. As such, they launch probing strikes with sunleech bowlers and javelins, with the deadliest payload being carried within the claws of the pterodon itself. An explosive payload designed by skink artisans exploding as they crash into the foe. Ribidon riders are truly merciless in combat. These will readily attack any creature despite its size. The beasts are seemingly driven by a single purpose and that is a desire to kill. Those skinks which choose to ride such a beast are often referred to as braves. These are the daredevils of skink kind. They choose to test their willpower to drive such a beast to slaughter, for controlling the mighty avian beast's rage is a true challenge. Seraphon wizards conjure small beasts known as blot toads within enemy ranks. The scent attracts the beasts, driving them into a frenzy. The frenzy will only end when the foe is rent asunder. Chameleon skinks are a peculiar subspecies of this skink, and possess their own incredible qualities that lend themselves to the Old One's great plan. These skinks possess the ability to reduce their bodies to shadowless forms, their scales blending with the surrounding colours and even bending the light that hits them. These skinks are able to allow foes to come within striking distance before they may begin to notice something might be amiss. They range ahead of the star hosts, raining poison darts on the foe. How these skinks came to be formed is unclear, even to some of the wisest starseers. However, the Slan know that these were created within the temple ships that pass through the dank gloom of the Ulgu. During this time, the power of its shadows seeped into the spawning pools. These warriors are often sent to assassinate targets ranging from Chaos Lords to mighty Uruk war bosses. Skinks form the churning mass of Seraphon society, and within the temple cities, the skinks litter the streets, sent on errands by their overseers and masters. Though often shorter than the dwarves of the mortal realms, these are incredibly quick nimble and clever beasts. They possess an incredible natural dexterity that lends themselves to create artworks and structures. Whilst they don't understand the purpose of these buildings, it is of no concern to them. They are simply content that the great plan and slan have willed such a structure to be built. Skinks are naturally frail within combat and attempt to avoid close quarter engagements. They are talented skirmishers within the Seraphon army. Razordons are raised by the skin cohorts to supplement the Seraphon army. Within the sweltering jungle temples, the beasts have chambers with stacks of eggs, incubating within strange aetheric technology left behind by the old ones. These devices are used to hatch all manner of Seraphon creatures. The Razordon have a myriad of uses, from herding the Seraphon's food sources to roaming the battlefield in deadly packs seeking to tear the enemy apart. Salamanders are capable of spraying horrible acid which ignites on contact with air, from massive fleshy sacs underneath their jaws. This acid melts anything it comes into contact with. Armour melts away like candle wax, as the enemy's skin and armour sloughs from their bones. These terrible beasts are used to guard the Seraphon flanks, or to drive through enemy hardpoints, capable of breaking even the most courageous of warrior retinues. 
Croxagors are the brutes of the Seraphon race, often towering shoulders above even the biggest of Saurus. Their scales are as tough as the armour of the God King's warriors, the Stormcast Eternals, heaving massive clubs that shatter the ground when they strike, and jaws littered with teeth capable of snapping any human in half with ease. These creatures have provided an invaluable source of strength when expanding the temple cities, and whilst they are respected by the Saurus, it is the Skinks that they share a close kinship with. The Croxagor will complete any task given by their Skink friends, and on the battlefield it is common to see these beasts flanking Skink cohorts. They wish to decimate any that wish to bring harm upon their fragile kin. Their immense scale is often understated. The Stegodon of the Seraphon are coated within layers of rock-hard scales, creating an impervious shield to missile weapons. Their massive crested head is perhaps the most known for its lethally sharp tipped horns. These beasts attempt to maintain their incredible mass whilst on an omnivorous diet, and will devour just about anything they can find. Their incredibly resolute digestive system will eat out any iota of nutrition. This is all in an attempt to keep the incredibly sized beast moving in the battlefield. One ogre tribe now worships such beasts as a sub-deity of Gorkamorka, after witnessing a herd run amok through the sweltering jungles they were moving through. The herd devoured everything within their path. Even the ogres with their hunger were impressed. Generally the beasts are docile and used to transport construction materials. Whilst many of the constellations have full stores of Stegodon eggs, these beasts can be spawned from the pools at an adult age. However, this would require a slan lending their incredible energies to the pool. When such a beast is created, they are said to be closely linked to Azure, their scales shimmering with the light of the heavens and are covered in sorts of ornate markings. The skinks utilise their incredible size, strapping howdahs to their back and from high ring javelins and crew the arcane war engines that are mounted upon them. Skystreak bows throw large projectiles across the battleground, shattering ranks of well-armoured warriors, whereas the sunfire throwers belch flames into the enemy lines. Whilst all of these weapons seem deadly, it is the Stegodon itself that is often capable of a much more devastation given the chance. Lowering their crested heads and charging through the lines of fleeing warriors, goring any that are unable to dive to safety. The skinks are often found looking on in awe during these moments, for they are truly manifested the magnificence and majesty of the old ones. Bastilodons are lumbering jungle fortresses, and there are few creatures within the realms that can compare to the creature's incredible resilience. Their scales, much like Stegodons, are as hard as Sigmarite, and are much more similar to that of bone constructs than flesh. Weapon hafts often shatter as warriors bray their barbed edges seeking to deal damage to such a beast, only to find themselves pulverised by the Bastilodon's heavy club tail. Such is the absurd resilience of these beasts, that even the ethereal weapons struggle to find purchase, for the light of azure burns fiercely within them. Its sheer brilliance burns away any strike which intends to deal them harm. It is said that there is an incredible market for their hides within the Caradron overlords. These will pay a hefty sum of coin for any which even have a few of the beast's massive scales. The beast's only weakness is often the downside of any heavily armoured beast within the mortal realms. The Bastilodon are limited to a slow, ponderous speed, such as the weight of their defensive structure. Due to their wide gait, these creatures prove to be the perfect vehicle to transport massive war machines to battle. Solar engines and arcs of Sotek are brought forth on the living war machines. The solar engines are capable of emitting an incredible, bright, focused beam of celestial energies. The heat of such a device superheats the foe. Any which wear armour to face the Bastildon suffer a particularly grim fate, as their flesh and armour quickly melts into one. The old enemy of the Seraphon, the forces of chaos, are particularly known to hate this weapon, for that which causes such destruction wishes to hide in the shadows. Perhaps the most curious of the two weapons that the Bastildon employ is the Ark of Sotek. 
This strange device is actually a miniature realm gate, which the Slan have connected to the deep writhing serpent pits that are burrowed deep beneath their temples. It is unknown whether it is on command, or whether they are agitated into performance, but once the Ark awakes, a serpent swarm is brought forth at an incredible pace. The greatest and toughest of monsters and champions have felt to the incredible accumulation of poisonous bites from countless fangs. When the Old Ones laid forth what has came to be known as the Great Plan, the sheer vastness of this task was impossible to consider. Only their incredible minds could perceive such an ambitious task, and many strange devices and structures were created to magnify their already terrifying power. Whilst many of these devices have laid dormant within grand vaults in glorious temple cities, many of these have found their way onto the back of the mighty Stegodon, and these are all but dormant. Their power grants a small glimmer into the raw, potent power that the Old Ones possessed. Only the Stegodon can carry such an artifact, for the incredible powers that it unleashes would spook any other. The potent arcane energies which throb throughout the device charge the air with barely contained potential. It is the members of the Skink Priest Brotherhoods which are chosen to guide such artifacts into battle. After touching the correct glyphic sequences, the device unleashes its overwhelming power. It may come as a surprise that the Slan don't truly understand how to use these devices, any which did have long been slain in the mortal realms. The Great Slan can only manipulate their power, rather than control it. This means that the results of activating such an engine are often pr unpredictable. The mighty Slan can only manipulate their power rather than control it. This means that the results of activating such an engine are often unpredictable. Enemies that stand in front of such engines might be blasted by bolts of arcane energy, or simply vanish from existence as holes within reality open and close surrounding them. Time can be rewritten in curious ways, as wounded and slain Seraphon re-knit themselves, or entirely new cohorts of warriors are spawned altogether. Due to the raw power that is unmanaged, this has led many of the Seraphon using these artifacts as a last resort on the battlefield. However, it is the Thunder Lizards and Tapok Breath constellations which have hoarded and spawned many of the Stegodon to wield these incredible engines. When many take the field, the foe should turn tail and run.